Good morning. Uh, my name is John Powers. I'm the moderator of the first panel, and I am not an expert on life sciences. But I have a great panel here, so you can ask me any question you want, and I'll get you the answer. Boston Properties is a leader in life sciences, but not in New York. We are the largest landlord in Boston and Cambridge, and also the largest landlord in San Francisco. So as a company, we are the largest office cap with about $30 billion in the country. So we do have some experience with life science, and we know that this is ripe for New York and can come to New York. Nancy, that was a great presentation, but the question is, how does all that really happen here? We have few sites. We don't have any of the space, so 1.7 million, Mitch said. We have little of the space that we need to have to attract life sciences, and we all know that New York is a complicated place to do real estate deals. Uh, there's few sites. Uh, the, we have a very complicated approval process, and how does that all work? But nonetheless, things get done in New York, and we've seen over the last 20 years a huge transition in the, in the makeup of the, from the fire sector to the TAMI sector, and now tech is large in the city and becoming larger and larger. So I think this will happen. I'm not sure how it happens. I'm not sure when it happens. And I hope to know a lot more about that at the end of today. So let me start off by asking one of our panelists who's been around a long time and has a lot of experience in, Ca in, in Cambridge, uh, how, which is one of the great centers right now for life sciences, as you know, how it happened there. And uh, Steve Papur, let me also congratulate you on your move to my alma mater, CVRE. Hope it all works out for you there. Steve's been around for 20 plus years in this, started his career at Trammell Crow, so real estate go in, goes into his DNA. But uh, he's had a lot of experience in life science. So Steve, tell us how it happened there and why it will come here. Great. Thank you, John. Appreciate the uh, introduction. Uh, we've got a, a slide. I don't know how we control the slides, but we've got a slide on uh, the Cambridge timeline. Uh, my uh, quick background, as John mentioned, 20-plus uh, years in Cambridge. Uh, I always say, rather be lucky than good. I uh, ended up in the, in the heart of a, uh, of a market that has exploded over the last 15 years in life science. It wasn't always the case. Uh, in the early 2000s, coming off of, uh, Y2, uh, coming off of Y2K, um, and, and the market uh, directly was impacted by sort of the lack of, uh, of anything that happened there. Uh, the Cambridge market was 30% you know, vacant. Uh, rents were uh, bottoming, bottoming out. It was one of the softest markets in the, on the East Coast. Uh, the life science uh, market was in its infancy. Uh, when, you, when you see the slide in a second, you'll see in the early, uh, in mid and late 80s, there was a few companies that, uh, that you'd recognize the names that had grown up in Cambridge. Uh, Biogen, Genzyme, Genetics Institutes. Uh, you know, in New York, you had an example of Regeneron. You know, I think it was in the late 80s that started uh, with some technology out of Columbia. Uh, in general, uh, the life science market was so speculative, as Nancy mentioned, uh, that uh, the, only, the, the only investor in that, in that sector was the federal government. So we used to track NIH funding. The NIH funding would uh, get announced. It would be uh, dedicated towards academia and towards uh, healthcare, uh, and so the life science research that happened, uh, similarly in New York, happened around the hospitals and, and the institution, institutions. Thank you. Great. Um, am I hitting the wrong green button? <laughs> um, so the, uh, the NIH funding, um, happened around the institutions, and so the, uh, the life science, there we go. Here's the timeline. So, um, so the, uh, the, ins the uh, research happened around, health, uh, around the healthcare institutions, and so the lab space was around the healthcare institutions. Think about the East Side Science Center uh, and why, why that's where it is. You know, in, in Boston, it was in Longwood Medical. The rents in, in Longwood <laughs> Medical, um, you know, in the 90s were significantly higher than they were in Cambridge. Uh, and space would come online, and, and the NIH funding would come in, and the, and the space would, would be uh, absorbed. As, as Nancy mentioned, uh, technology has changed that discussion. Uh, the Human Genome Project, which started in 1990, uh, you know, kind of when, when it came out with uh, its uh, initial results around the sequencing of the human genome, that changed the entire discussion. 
And so the way that we describe it is that it took, you know, the idea of looking for a needle uh, in a football stadium into looking for a needle within sort of a 10-yard spread. Uh, and then as technology evolved uh, and, and uh, virtual research evolved, uh, like, you know, in every sector, um, that research became much more viable. And so what came out of that was, it, was a, 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 a market that was viable from private investment, was less dependent on NIH funding, was more sensitive to labor. Uh, and so in our market, uh, when you think about sort of what happened and why, uh, if you look at that uh, timeline, uh, the biggest sort of single moment that happened in the Cambridge market that changed everything was when Novartis uh, relocated their worldwide R&D headquarters uh, to Cambridge. Um, you know, in the early 2000s, it was a 200,000 square foot requirement. Uh, it came into town, um, and it was it was news. Um, you know, fast forwarding to, uh, to to today, they have two million square feet of space. But what more importantly, what happened was the cluster was created because the mentality around big pharma had been up until that point to do their research uh, within their campus and to not collaborate uh, in places like New Jersey and Pearl River, um, Switzerland. Um, and the idea was, all right, well, we, we'll hire our scientists, we'll do our own research, we've got good data, we'll, we'll figure out our own innovation and, and go from there. You know, no surprise, didn't work. Uh, and so once Novartis came into, into, uh, into Cambridge uh, and said, you know, this is what we're going to do, then uh, Pfizer came and then um, Santa Fe Aventus bought Genzyme and the market was created. Uh, and, and that, you know, to me is the moment that we need in New York City, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, the early stage companies uh, that we have in Cambridge and Boston um, are designed uh, intentionally to get in the way of big pharma. And so like any other investment, uh, the, the platforms and technology, it's not necessarily to sell the company, but it might be to sell a drug. Uh, it might be to, to partner up with, with one of the groups that's there. Uh, so the technology is, you know, is basically designed and funded in such a way that they can get to speed the market very quickly and the large pharma companies will, will come in. The market has grown significantly, which we'll see in a second, uh, in Cambridge. Uh, so if you look at it uh, from an overall market size, uh, you know, we're about 107 million square feet of, of lab and office space in Cambridge today. Ten years ago, we had about 11 million square feet of lab space. And today, we have about 18 million square feet of lab space. And in ten years, I think we'll have 28 million square feet of lab space. The, the growth, uh, on average, really over the last 15 years has been around 600,000 square, square feet per year. Over the last 10 years, it's been almost 700,000 square feet per year. So, you know, it's a big number. Uh, it's not, obviously, uh, we had, a, you know, 2007 and 2008 was bad for us, too. Um, you know, the good years were, were better than that. But pretty significant growth that in, in aggregate adds up to a pretty significant amount of, uh, of space. We'll get to it in a second. The biggest challenge with, with Boston is, uh, is labor. It's not, it's, not, it's not demand, right? And so this idea of open job recs. Uh, how do you fill up the benches? It's a very challenging environment for all aspects of, of these life science companies. And the real estate market is extremely tight, and the rents have gone up significantly. So, that, so the market has evolved to a point, you know, sort of a tipping point a little bit, I would say. Uh, New York, you've heard the, you know, the number 1.8 million square feet, um, over, you know, 472 million square feet. I mean, it's just, it's, just a, it's such a crazy, uh, you know, difference between the markets and what's happened. Uh, you know, we... We think that uh, if you project a conservative amount of square footage on the growth side, which is 500,000 square feet, so if you think if Boston is 700,000 square feet, you know, in New York, if we said 500,000 square feet a year, you roll that over 10 years, obviously you end up with, you know, 5 million square feet of growth in the market. I think that's a very realistic number. Uh, it is a daunting number to think about 500,000 square feet of new lab space coming online in a market that doesn't really, hasn't really seen that much growth. Uh, I, I will tell you that, um, one of the things that's, that I find interesting about New York is that uh, to get to 500,000 square feet of growth in the in life science sector, uh, that's a lot of 10,000 square foot companies. It just is. It's a lot of 25,000 square foot companies. It's a lot of 50,000 square foot companies. The, the, the key, in my opinion, uh, for the growth of, of New York life science is the Novartis moment for New York. You know, whoever that may be in New Jersey, maybe it's somebody in, in Europe, maybe it's somebody in Boston that comes into the market and says, this is a market where I can grow my company. So, so going back to my labor point, Boston, you can't find scientists, you can't find executives, you can't find folks to work in the companies. Very competitive, um, as competitive of a labor environment as you can imagine. Come down to New York City, and for every 4.8 folks that have a life science degree that live in Manhattan or the boroughs, there's one job. So what does that mean? It means you've got an excess of labor here. 
It means that that labor is either working in other industries or is commuting out to New Jersey. I cannot tell you how many folks that I know in this industry uh, that are commuting out, that live in Manhattan, that commute out to New Jersey, right? And so my opinion is the way to connect the dots is to, to connect the concept of the labor is here, the science is here, obviously the, the, the money is here, the institutions are here, and you've got a, 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 the most creative real estate uh, development community in the world, right? And so I think the idea around it is to pair up the concept of creating these incubator labs that are going to be the early stage companies and then attracting you know, a company that's in New Jersey uh, that might have a presence somewhere else that is having a challenge on the labor side. And you think about you know, sort of how you would do that and how accessible. As someone who commutes to New York every week, I can tell you this is a very accessible commute. You know, if you think about the idea of taking the train from Boston to New York, it's a three and a half hour train ride, which you can be pretty functional on. And so the idea around in today's environment moving forward for the next 10 years is where a company could say, all right, we're going to have a, a location for research in, in Boston and Cambridge. We're going to have a, a location for research in, in uh, New York City. We're going to have a location for research in Philadelphia, maybe, New, uh, maybe in, in D.C. And this whole a sell a quarter idea would really unlock, I think, growth for the entire market. Uh, and, you know, from a New York City perspective, when you think about what that could mean as, as an industry sector, I think the 500,000 square feet in the context of that conversation is really light. Seems like a very achievable number and seems like a very conservative estimate. And so that, that is, you know, sort of from my perspective coming in uh, from out of the market is, is a little bit of what I think might be the key for the, for the growth of the market. Thanks, Steve. Um, <clears throat> let's move now to the city and uh, the city meaning economic development, New York City, and how the city is going to support uh, the expansion of life sciences, why they want to, why they want to support it, what their vision is, and, and specific things, steps that they'll take. So we have Doug Thady here from, he's the leader from economic development in life sciences. So Doug, give us a little insight into New York City. My name is Doug Thede, um, lead the life science and healthcare team at EDC. Uh, part of that team is leading the LifeSci NYC initiative, um, which Mayor de Blasio announced in December of 2016. Uh, that is the $500 million 10-year uh, strategic plan of uh, 10 different points, 10 different facets uh, that Mitchell alluded to at the onset uh, of uh, our remarks. Um, the reason we're doing that uh, from a city's perspective is uh, historically EDC has made targeted investments in different industry sectors. So if you think about New York City, uh, some of our, our panelists, I think Nancy mentioned it really well, you, th you think of uh, it being a finance town, you think of it being a media town more recently in the last 10 years, as Steve alluded to, you think of it um, as a technology town. Uh, we would like this to be uh, a city known for life sciences. So New Yorkers have the ability to uh, grow up and have jobs uh, not only in our great academic institutions and the, and the bi basic biomedical research labs, but also around commercial uh, research and development and commercial uh, pharmaceutical and biotechnology industry. Uh, historically, uh, New York City has had great institutions similar to Boston, as, as Steve mentioned. Uh, so we have nine academic medical centers here that have uh, a tremendous amount of NIH funding, uh, second to Boston, uh, and, and great researchers and, and investigators who continue to have that cutting edge science. But historically, we have not had those, uh, those scientists be able to turn their science into companies here in New York City. And the predominant reasons uh, for that have been either space or talent. Um, we all know New York's expensive. Uh, this community knows that as well as anybody, but, uh, but I'll kind of let the, uh, the innovators in the real estate community um, talk to that a little bit later uh, throughout the panel. But the space and talent issues have really been the catalyst for uh, why this initiative exists and why we're excited about it from a city's perspective. So I'm gonna talk a little bit, I won't go through the whole 10 point plan, uh, but given that it's a real estate audience uh, and there's a lot of expertise on that, I'm gonna, I'm gonna touch on uh, some facets that are a little bit more relevant for that. So when we, when we think of the 10 year plan, we think of it in three different buckets. One is uh, connecting industry to the academic community. Uh, the second is unlocking space for companies to grow. And the third is building a uh, talent pipeline uh, for the future of New York City. 
uh, on the left-hand side um, of the slides that, that, that don't exist, we, we've got about um, $150 million of city capital uh, through two different programs that are designed to help with long-term strategic plans for New York City. Uh, one of those, uh, I believe Mitchell alluded to in his opening remarks of the, the life science hub concept. So this is a hundred, up to $100 million of city capital uh, and potentially city-owned sites to design a innovation district. We really want this to be uh, kind of a Bell Labs of uh, New York City. Uh, many may not know that Bell Labs uh, at one time was in New York City and, and one of the forefront uh, innovators in the tech economy. Um, we'd like to see something like that exist in New York City uh, and have that be not just a building, but an area where some of those 10 to uh, 15,000 companies could grow uh, and expand not only in that building, but in the adjacent regions for that. We also want it to have uh, that collaborative space that Nancy alluded to in her opening remarks. We don't want it to be um, just a building uh, as it stands. So um, the second would be the research and development facilities. Uh, where we have recently launched a request for information uh, to the community where we're asking the nonprofit and scientific community to come up with what are the, the best ideas that will not only uh, put New York on the map for today, but as Steve alluded to of you know, 500,000 square feet and, and additional space coming online, what are the scientific facilities and needs that will help with translational research of getting uh, that, that lab science more towards products, medicines, and innovations that can stay in New York City. So companies would have access to it, research would have access to it. Um, so this is a, a project that we've envisioned would be smaller grants of maybe um, two to $15 million. Um, the call for proposals for that uh, is in mid-July, um, for uh, July 13th, I believe is the cutoff date, where we will um, be requesting ideas and then assessing what the community says um, what are those, those big scientific ideas of need that can help put New York on the map for more infrastructure? And really through both of those, we don't want those proposals or those ideas to be about one entity. Uh, I think what, what Steve mentioned in some of his, his remarks were, you've got organic growth, you've got academic uh, companies, and you've got large biotech and, and pharmaceutical companies that are in New York that make up some of those ingredients. So really through those two uh, proposals and, and the city capital, we want to encourage creative partnerships and creative responses to help build that community so it's not one specific entity. Um, this, the second bucket that we think about is unlocking space for companies to grow. And, and there are a few programs that I'll, I'll talk to you. So one, um, we're seeing that while these, these other two programs that I mentioned are very important, they're going to be long-term strategic plans uh, that may take five, ten years to come online. But what we're seeing now is that there is a, a shortage of uh, space for those companies to go uh, that may need that 10,000 square feet. So we've launched two concepts. One is our IDA tax abatement program, uh, which is a discretionary benefit program of up to $300 million in real estate tax abatements um, that the city could control um, to help uh, bring lab space and life science usage online. So uh, this may be um, throughout all five boroughs of New York City. Uh, it's something that we've seen an extraordinary amount of activity from both the traditional real estate uh, community in New York City that is now considering life science usage, as well as uh, other entrants from uh, different markets that have uh, extensive lab and life science experience from other markets that are now considering New York uh, for some of the statistics that Steve had mentioned earlier. Uh, the second program is a little bit more near term of maybe helping some of those companies um, that need five or um, 10,000 square feet uh, and don't have a place to go. And that's designed through expansion space funds, which is also a discretionary program that we've recently launched where companies uh, and developers can, can apply to uh, EDC for either a loan uh, or perhaps uh, depending on the stage of a company um, for uh, a convertible note to help with fit out of space. So if you were considering, um, for just example's sake, fit out of, of this space to go into more of lab usage, um, how could we help um, use EDC funds for fit out of that space, closing the gap between what uh, a CEO of an uh, emerging startup would be looking for and what the real estate developer is looking to cover the cost to get this life science ready. 
Um, so those are a couple of the interventions that we've been focused on now. Um, we've, we've spent a lot of time with the, uh, the broader community trying to figure out what are the near-term needs uh, to help with those, those space challenges. Um, the last component that I would say, and, and folks have alluded to it, uh, are really the incubators. So we're very excited that for a long time, as you came out of the academic community, um, you didn't have a place to go as far as um, you had to stay in your lab space. Now with uh, BioLabs coming online later this year, JLabs opening uh, in the Genome Center next week, uh, Launch Labs uh, opened up last year in Alexandria Center, they're about 100,000 square feet for startups to grow. It's not quite at that 500,000 uh, square feet that Steve alluded to, but we feel that there's a very good path there now, but we're trying to focus on where do those companies go next. Thanks very much. Um, before we move on, let me just ask you uh, to, st uh, to stand in. We don't have anyone from the state here, and uh, I know you're not speaking for the state, but you're very aware of what the state's view of this is, so maybe you could comment on that. Yeah, so uh, within about a day of each other, I think, the state also uh, launched a $650 million uh, plan for um, the life science industry throughout New York State. Um, it is uh, something that we have worked very closely with our colleagues at Empire State Development. Uh, I think if you ask them, they might say uh, a lot of our focus here is um, at EDC is more on these real estate-based initiatives. Um, they're going to be looking at things not only within New York City, but throughout, um, uh, throughout different areas. I think recently they've launched a project of, um, called the Empire um, Development. Um, uh, it's EDI. Um, the Empire Development um, Innovation Group, I believe, that is really trying to look at translational research through four uh, upstate entities, Rochester and Buffalo, I think, are two of them, which is modeled off the TRI-I um, TDI program here through some of our institutions on the Upper East Side. Um, they were also instrumental in um, the J-Labs project here, where I think $17 million of their uh, 650 went to the J-Labs opening uh, next month, which is about a 30,000 square foot incubator, uh, which will come online. Thanks very much. Uh, next, we'll move to uh, the question of finding space. And uh, Bill Harvey logged some time in at EDC, and since then he's represented a number of tenants looking for space in the market. Bill, what are, what are they looking for, and how, how do they go about their process? Um, John, thanks very much for, uh, for having me on the panel. I, I, I really appreciate it. Um, so it's very interesting. So I, I got started really, um, it was almost a fluke um, about seven years ago. I was, um, I just arrived at, at, at Newmark and a, a colleague of mine uh, from, from EDC had asked me um, if I'd be interested in, in, in helping her out with, um, I think at the time it was a, a 40,000 square foot project. Um, that actually became the, the, uh, the New York Genome Center, which uh, when we signed the deal um, about six years ago, was about 175,000 square feet. So I was, uh, it was my uh, baptism by fire. Um, it was a great way for me to, to learn the industry. I think that we evaluated well over 100 buildings. I think we, we toured probably 35 or, or 40 in four of the five boroughs. Um, I think that the lessons that we learned there and then are still applicable today. Life science tenants like to cluster with other uh, life science tenants. And I think that, um, as Steve alluded to before, I think it's really the, the institutions that are the, the, uh, the pull. So, so we did a map. Um, it's a little bit granular here. Um, but it just kind of highlights um, some of the, uh, the nine, um, I think we have a, a, a tenth, actually, um, institution. And I think that they um, tend to, to, uh, to pull the interest in, in the uh, in the geographies. Um, I've, I've kind of identified um, four, maybe five different locations that, that we think are really primed for, um, uh, for life science clustering. And I'll, I'll kind of start with uh, the west side. Um, a couple of different submarkets within the west side. It's the, um, to the north, it's the, the uh, Manhattan uh, factory district. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of interest uh, because of, obviously, Columbia University but also CUNY. Um, I would say that the one difference, um, I, think, I, think, I think clearly uh, Kendall Square is an inspiration for what we want to do here, but I think it's not the inspiration. I think the other uh, one, 
the one difference that we have to um, kind of think about is um, the uh, uh, Manhattan, uh, New York City, really, uh, public transportation system. It's, it's so extensive. We actually, in a, in a first draft of this, we actually tried to, uh, to layer over the, the, uh, the subway lines, and it just got a little bit too busy. So for those that are from, from, uh, from outside the city and aren't as familiar uh, with New York City, it's a um, uh, subway system. It's, it's, uh, it's something that I'm, I'm, I'm happy to uh, talk with you about um, after this. Uh, 619 West 54th Street, um, I saw Matt Weir from uh, Taconic here. I think that uh, the Taconic has really uh, planted the flag um, on the west side um, in the neighborhood that used to be uh, Hell's Kitchen. Um, I would say thirdly, the, the area uh, just north of us, uh, Hudson Square um, into uh, Tribeca. Uh, a couple of panelists have, have uh, talked about it before, but the, uh, the Genome Center itself at 101 A of A, which is also the, uh, the site of, of J Labs. Um, I see Nicole McKnight from uh, BioLabs. They're about uh, three blocks away from, from there. That is the closest thing I think that we really have to a cluster right now, the, uh, uh, the Hudson Square area. The other two areas, um, just real quick, are the east side, um, kind of centered around the Alexandria Center. There's a lot of interest um, in that area. I think that, that Alexandria is the, um, the magnet, really, for, uh, for life science um, um, in New York City right now. Um, they obviously have th the ability to do a third tower. Maybe we can get into that um, a little bit later. Um, but 750,000 square feet of the 1 million square feet of uh, private sector lab spaces is at Alexandria. There's a couple of development sites um, uh, relatively close by. The, the area that I'm, I'm very bullish on is actually Long Island City. Um, I think for those that aren't from New York, and even actually for some that are from New York, um, Long Island City is not on Long Island. It's, it's actually three stops away from, uh, from Grand Central um, on the 7 train. I think um, as we talk about clustering and as, as um, companies are making their decisions, you have to remember that these companies are competing for talent, and they're competing with talent with um, the Googles, the Facebooks of the world. Um, young, very well-educated, very sophisticated, very urban um, uh, kids, really. And I think that um, as we have um, kind of evolved as, as, a, as a potential life science market, um, a lot of the signs are actually pointing to Long Island City. I know that um, there was um, significant interest um, on the RFEI in Long Island City. I would, um, I think it kind of starts with uh, public transportation. There's about eight different um, uh, subway lines that, uh, that run through what I would call well-located Long Island City. Um, that is a challenge in, in certain other parts of the city. Um, but I also think that, um, that Long Island City is kind of on the upswing right now. It's, um, it's, um, it's matured certainly as a residential market, um, but the, the, uh, the life science market is, is, um, is, is, is primed for that area. I think, um, I've heard actually Kate Merton uh, speak about this before, but the airports, um, um, I don't wanna, wanna steal her thunder because I know um, she's uh, speaking later, but I've, I've heard her speak very, elo very eloquently about the, some of the early success that uh, the JLab has had in New York City, and I've heard her also talk about the, the airports, um, especially the international airports. That's actually something else that, um, that really bodes well uh, for Long Island City. It is um, in the same borough as, as uh, both uh, JFK and LaGuardia. I think just to um, take a step back, and uh, um, Nancy uh, certainly uh, touched on some of these things um, as well. What these companies are looking for is um, it's great space for sure, and I'll get into that in, in a second, but I think it's, it's really a sense of, of, of community. Um, it's the hotels, it's the restaurants, it's the proximity to housing. Um, it's the bars, it's the health clubs, it's, it's all of these um, things that, that, um, that employers are looking for because their, their potential um, employees really demand it. Um, just a quick, this is gonna be difficult to read, but this is a, a uh, building comparison matrix. 
that we actually put together um, about six or seven years ago. I've kind of tweaked it from um, time to time. Um, this is actually a, um, a survey that we did for a client um, in late 2017. I think it's actually very interesting, but this is a, um, this is a uh, tenant that's from um, outside of the five boroughs. Um, this was actually the, uh, the first tour that we did for them, and, and they, they only had about two hours, so we were very limited in terms of what we could uh, show them. So we did um, take them to a couple of different markets uh, purposefully. We took them to Long Island City, we uh, took them uh, to the west side, and then we actually took them um, downtown. Um, what I thought was very interesting was that this was a survey that was done in October, November of, of, of 2017. Two of the three buildings were actually buildings that we um, evaluated six years before for the, uh, for the Genome Center. So it's a very small universe of properties. There's over 450 million square feet of space in New York City. But when it gets right down to it, there's actually um, there's a very small number of properties that are really primed for this. I think the, the threshold issue, um, um, and it certainly was for us with the uh, um, Genome Center, is actually the landlord uh, friendliness to um, doing something like this. I think a lot of people in the room here are developers and they're thinking about an acquisition. That's, um, that's, that's a different story. It's very difficult to do kind of one-off um, leasing transactions in these buildings because the, uh, the, capital, is, um, the capital requirements are so great. Um, and I think that that's a good thing. It used to be when I would go to, to life science real estate events that I would know most of the people, and it's actually very refreshing for me to see uh, so many new faces here today. Um, just a quick look about the the um, the, uh, the physical char characteristics of, of the building, um, and I apologize because it's 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 uh, difficult to see. But we talk about uh, floor loads; uh, the bigger, the better. We talk about ceiling heights; the higher, the better. Um, a threshold issue is also um, uh, uh, zoning. You really want to be in a, in an M zone. Um, I know that, that EDC, Doug, uh, came out a couple of years ago with a, um, with a memorandum that, that would suggest that uh, commercially zoned buildings are okay for the most robust type of lab work. I don't think that that's really been tested yet. Um, I'm a little bit out of my lane talking about zoning. I see, I see Gus Mazza um, in, the, in the, uh, the front row. He's, uh, he's really an expert on that. But I think it's um, I think it's a lot of things. It's it's the the uh, you know when I first got in, involved in the uh, the genome center, we all thought that this could be even a uh, use that could uh, go in a basement somewhere, and I could not have been more wrong. It's um, it's a tech tenant with a little bit of a twist, um, obviously the uh, the wet labs, but I think that um, I think that the same drivers that um, kind of went to create, uh, to turn uh, Midtown South into uh, the market that it is today are really kind of at, at play with uh, life science as well. Thanks, Bill. Uh, before we uh, move on to drilling down on the buildings, uh, Steve, I'd like to go back to you. Uh, so uh, Bill put on the table Long Island City, Alexandria in the East, and the West. What's your choice and why? Uh, can I pick the fourth category of uh, around Penn Station uh, is, a, is a location that I like. Uh, um, That's the West. Um, you know, I just, I feel like New Jersey is very important. Um, from a labor perspective, uh, you can have all the scientists in the world, but you need the executives to run the companies. And I think if you talk to the VCs uh, that invest in the sector, I think their big question mark and concern in, in New York City is lack of executive leadership for these type companies. Uh, you know, those clients of ours in, in Boston, are on their fifth, sixth, seventh company uh, that they run the actual companies. Uh, that that labor pool uh, lives in New Jersey, and so uh, when we got to town, we were big proponents of the West Side. We continue to be big proponents of the West Side, and you think about the accessibility to New Jersey from Penn Station. I, I just, I, I really am pretty bullish on the West Side, and specifically in that area, uh, you know, from Penn Station, sort of uh, downtown. Thank you. So the you said the 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 Jersey label lives in New Jersey as well as works there, and that's a critical point in terms of the developing life science companies. Yes, yeah, I mean, I, I believe that as uh, the life science labor uh, pool moves to the suburbs as they get, you know, as they get older, uh, they move, for the most part, to New Jersey. Uh, they, 
you know, a lot of them actually work in New Jersey while they're living in Manhattan, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, and if you look at the, you know, the, the pharmaceutical companies that are in New Jersey, if you're in the sector, it's just a natural, natural pull. And we've done the uh, analytics for quite a few of our companies that are in Cambridge, I mean, that are in uh, New York City. And once you get to a certain level, uh, the pull uh, south uh, to New Jersey is, is very significant. Okay, thank you. Let's move into the specifics of the buildings now. We have, a, we have a slide up here, hard to read, but it shows different floor plates and different uh, floor loads, different uh, configurations. And we, we asked Steve Gifford, who's with Perkins Eastman had, and has been designing lab space and uh, looking at buildings for a long time. Steve, give us a little insight into what we need for the buildings to function effectively for life science. We have a, we have a large building stock in New York, but they don't all have large floor loads, great floor plates, and uh, ceiling heights are very challenging. So help us out and, and, and give us a little insight, Steve. Thanks. So uh, I get really excited about envisioning research space that really uh, accelerates discovery. That's what it's all about. We need to create environments for researchers in old buildings or new buildings that help them collaborate, do their interdisciplinary work, and really accelerate, because everybody wants the discoveries faster and faster these days. So I'm going to talk a little bit about physical characteristics and, and, and also the spaces, not just the lab spaces, but uh, I, I like to think a lot of discovery happens outside the lab, and it can really happen everywhere. So we need to create exciting, transparent spaces for researchers uh, to get through their day and be successful. I'm not going to go through all these bullet points, but uh, the lab trends include a tremendous need for flexibility, for plug and play. Uh, gone are the days of solid walls and fixed casework. It's all movable casework. It's all transparency. It's all people seeing what others are doing and sharing their ideas. Uh, so the trend, if you go back a little bit, uh, if you looked at a lab facility, it would be mostly open uh, lab benches. Uh, but then uh, equipment became so much more important. So these days, the equipment, the lab support spaces are, are equal in uh, square footage to the open lab benches. The other thing that's really transformed laboratory environments is computational research. So you see in this chart, you see in the orange, the office space or, or you know, uh, technology space has increased. And, and that's going to continue to grow. Nancy referred to that. It's all about the relationship of wet uh, research to computational research. But what's really happening now is the collaborative core. We're, we're pushing the equipment. The equipment has to be convenient, but, but we really want the people in the center of activity because that's where the ideas are and that's where the creations uh, take place. So I'm not going to go through all these statistics, but if you have a research group that's more heavily uh, wet lab researchers, it's going to require more assignable square feet per researcher. Uh, many uh, research groups are hybrid, computational and wet, a little bit less square footage, and the dry researchers are really more like what you would design for office space, technology space. Um, Bill talked about, uh, I totally agree with him, you know, there are some standards, some uh, kind of, I've listed some minimums, but in science, the, be the higher the floor loading, uh, the better off you are. The higher the ceilings, the better off you are. Uh, columns can be a problem. Uh, a, a grid that's mod module at uh, 10 feet is not quite enough. We're looking for at least multiples of 10 feet six because of the bench requirements uh, and so forth. So life science facilities are very energy intensive. Uh, designing them, you, we need to design with our engineers scalable systems uh, because particularly small companies can't f afford a lot of capital investment, but they are very le uh, energy intensive and they've got to be carefully designed to be energy efficient, creating greater value for the tenants, 
uh, the owners, uh, et cetera. So th this is a lab that was renovated at a hospital for special surgery. If I showed you a picture of the old lab, it would look like many uh, incredibly old, incredibly opaque spaces that you've walked through. It, it does prove that we can create flexible, transparent space in older buildings. Uh, if we do have the luxury, I, I assume some of the market will uh, be satisfied with new buildings as well as renovated buildings. New buildings obviously will, uh, if, if, if you have the capital dollars to, to create the core and shell, will give you some more flexibility, some ideal floor to floors, and, uh, and you know, good, good uh, shaft locations. Everything can be exactly where it wants to be. We talked about technology, you're gonna see even in life sciences, more spaces like this at MIT. Uh, a tremendous amount of the work is done on computers these days. So the, the scientists don't spend all their time in the labs. They need other kinds of spaces. They need during the day, they have long days. They need to contemplate, they need to collaborate, they need to innovate in imaginative spaces. And recharging, just like our cell phones, our days are long, we get a lot of information. We've got to get away from the action and recharge. You've got to create spaces like that for the scientists. Uh, larger spaces are also required. Uh, Nancy referred to a community of researchers. Uh, researchers want to be next to each other, even if they're competing companies. They want, to, they want to be in a shared environment. So within the building, we create spaces that by day are for small collaboration. By night, <coughs> can become a forum space. Uh, the Kennedy School at Harvard is like one of the best examples of this. It's this incredible uh, daily collaboration space for small groups, but at night, almost every evening, they have a presentation and uh, an idea exchange. Uh, the younger generation is coming in, they socialize around food. Food is very important. Uh, so buildings need to have gathering spaces that are rich with, with food and social opportunities. And uh, the lower right hand, corner is a space uh, I had the pleasure of working with the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Now, they uh, obviously don't have the advantages of New York. Their challenge is to create some of the things that already exist in New York. Uh, they needed to create a destination place, a place where venture capitalists, companies, and the Mayo clinicians can get together and work on projects together. It's going to be a tough challenge in Rochester, I think. New York, uh, I'm also very bullish on New York. New York has so many of the things already that Rochester wants to create for themselves. And uh, uh, really, you need to create an ecosystem. It's not just about the buildings the researchers work in. They want an exciting live, work, play, urban environment. And what city is better than that, uh, than New York? I'm not gonna go through all this detail, but uh, older buildings can be great in terms of transforming, but they've got to be transformative on the inside. They've got to be those transparent, flexible spaces on the inside, uh, cool spaces for researchers. Uh, we analyze the, the different building components on the right. Uh, the structure of the building, if maintained, can last in over 100 years. The skin of the building, uh, you know, 60 years or so until it needs to be repaired. The mechanical systems change over time and they do need to be replaced about every, you know, 35, 40 years and fit out, uh, even, if, e even if tenants are changing, they, the lab spaces should be designed so that not everything has to be rebuilt for new tenants. Thank you. Steve, uh, I have uh, a question about New York and life sciences and the building stock here related to venting. This is the city of high rises and I think that presents some challenge. Could you comment on that? Uh, sure, yeah, so you know, the venting idea. Uh, either, either Steve, thank you. No, no, Steve, go ahead. No, no, I've talked enough already. <laughs> well, uh, actually some, uh, uh, 
New York has been very adaptive in that, um, in that case. I remember the days uh, when, like, uh, Mitch Simpler and I used to go into the fire department and we needed to convince them that ganging, uh, you know, they had the, the old code required every individual lab to have a separate exhaust, which meant it was hard to create the extra uh, venting capacity that you need in an urban environment. Uh, a bunch of us helped convince the fire department that that was sort of archaic thinking. So generally, we collect the exhaust at the top of the building uh, uh, into a plenum, and we rocket it at high velocities uh, to make sure that, you know, there are a lot of lab buildings in this city the right next to residential apartments, and, and that's one of the ways we deal with the discharge. And what's the height limit on doing that? Uh, height limit on... 20 stories, 30, 40? Uh, yeah, that's an interesting, but I, I would say 20. New York, New York has also kind of created some of the tallest buildings, so uh, there are chemical limitations as you go further up in the building, but I would say a 20-story lab building is very achievable. I would, just, I would just add that the size of the floor plate is important. So if you, had, if you could get a 50,000 square foot floor plate, you can go taller. If it's a smaller floor plate, the whole idea around vertical penetrations as you get higher in the building, they just become, from an architectural perspective, uh, you know, a very limiting factor. Okay, thank you. So, Matt Ashberg, you're, uh, you're uh, with Heinz, and you've taken over a very large portfolio in a prime area for life science, it would seem. It's on both Bill's list and Steve's uh, very good list. Uh, there's a lot of space there, a lot of different existing buildings, and we know Trinity has uh, a lot of other pads in that. All the developers in the room know that. Um, we also know Norges has a lot of money, so that's a plus when, uh, when looking at this. Uh, tell us what, uh, how life science would fit into the, the uh, portfolio in Hudson Square. Sure. So um, let me start just by explaining <coughs> what the portfolio is and sort of how we had been managing it before we had life sciences on our radar. Um, this is sort of just our evolving thinking as we're starting to pay attention to the sector. So. Um, Heinz began managing the portfolio in 2016, um, along with our partners, uh, Trinity Church and Norges Bank. Um, it's 6 million square feet, um, 12 buildings in Hudson Square, so that's south of West Village, west of Soho, north of Tribeca. Um, we comprise about 40% of that neighborhood. And so um, the strategy going in was basically to um, create a consistent management approach to the portfolio. Um, rationalize the leasing across spaces. You have floor plates ranging from 30,000 square feet to about 80,000. Um, and there are tons of um, examples of partial floor tenants or full floor tenants. Um, and we're trying to sort of rationalize the leasing to create large blocks of space um, and appeal to mainly tech tenants. Um, we did some demographic studies as we were getting interested in the portfolio and, and found that Hudson Square is actually the largest um, tech employee concentration in all of New York City. Um, only second to Silicon Valley and, and a lot of other New York submarkets are far down the list. And so that really appealed to us from an office leasing perspective. Um, one of the levers that we've been trying to do um, just generally in the portfolio is improve the ground floor. So we've talked a bit about um, the appeal of live, work, play. We've got a whole retail leasing strategy to improve the ground floor experience and bring a lot of new food and beverage into the portfolio. Um, so as we've been going about that, it, we've had a lot of success on the office leasing standpoint. Um, but we've also taken note of what Doug's described as far as the city's support for life sciences and seen what Alexandria has been doing. And so it's, it's just been um, pretty obvious to us that we need to get our arms around this space and understand sort of what it is that we're missing out on if we don't um, turn an eye toward life sciences. So um, this year we began um, a study effort um, starting with meeting Nancy through Mitch. Um, so engaged Nancy Kelly and Associates and JBMB and Hunter Roberts and Elkis Manfredi and Milrose. Um, and CBRE and Newmark, all to um, gather around our partnership and sort of advise on um, how should we think through the trade-offs between either stay the course, do office leasing, or think about conversion of a building at some point in the future, or buildings at some point in the future to allow life sciences. So the way we approached it, um, we basically started a study where we took an inventory of some basic building characteristics across the portfolio, um, came up with four candidates that we thought were um, you know, good uh, 
physical candidates for um, for a conversion. They all had um, 11, 6 to 12, 6 clear heights, 250 pound live loads, um, all sort of medium height buildings with fairly large floor plates, you know, starting at about 30,000 square feet. Um, and in many cases, they had latent elevator shafts that could be used for penetrations already going through the building that would allow shaft space. And so, um, but we also have a 10 year CapEx plan that's sort of slated for a, a very logical way to do CapEx for office use in the portfolio. So the question became, you know, can we study buildings and figure out where the tipping point is where we might get comfort in changing to life sciences at some point in the future. So we started with four buildings. We decided to narrow it down to one building as far as a first study project. Um, and we just approached that building very logically using Elkis Manfredi to design um, floor by floor test fits. We, we took sort of a progression of whether you would have an anchor tenant in the building or floor by floor leasing. Um, we thought about an idealized um, world where you would have the tenants that have the most requirements for shaft space located higher up in the building and ideally find a tenant that has lesser need for shaft space lower in the building. So that factors into some of the logic. Um, JBNB helped us identify where we would run vertical penetrations through the building, in this case using one elevator shaft as the main means of um, vertical connectivity. And then we also thought about, you know, there are trade-offs that you start going down where, um, like talking about venting, um, you need cannon fans to get rid of noxious fumes. And so those are somewhat noisy, they take up space. Um, if you go down that path, you'd have to think about maybe closing the door in terms of um, improving the rooftop for potential use as just a tenant amenity later in the um, life of the building. And so um, we, we basically conducted that study and, and gathered the results. And, and the punchline is um, it makes a ton of sense to convert a building to life sciences if you can get the internal resolve to do the full thing. Um, it's in the order of um, $70 million positive to our MPV over like a 10 year period when we think about the, the costs involved is about 130 bucks a foot to convert the whole building. And then you, you get a, a chance to lease a, you know, to attractive profile of life sciences tenants. Um, on the other hand, it, it doesn't make as much sense to convert starting at around a floor or two floors. So, so really the, the judgment we're coming to is it makes a lot of sense to think about your, your go forward leasing strategy and think about where you have blocks of space that may come to market. And if you're left with a lot to lease, um, that's, it would be great to have another arrow in the quiver to um, appeal to life sciences um, tenants. And so we're sort of using that study as a starting point and still thinking about how we react to what the city's pursuing with the um, life sci initiative and, and thinking about just other tenants in the market that we're learning about through Newmark and CBRE and Nancy. Um, and so I guess we're considering it as some sort of an open door and an opportunity for continued study, but it's definitely one of those things where you want to you do your homework building by building first to get the, uh, the conclusions as far as how the building specs would align for leasing and then think about whether you want to go there as far as a, you know, entire life sciences pitch or if you want to have sort of a dual approach to, you know, still appeal to the office leasing market but also um, you know, turn toward life sciences. Thanks very much. Um, could you share with us uh, what you projected for rents and for, um, for to make, I heard the good NPV, so that's always sure. perks me up a little. Could you, the, the rents and also the TI package and maybe uh, one of the Steves or both of the Steves could comment on the, uh, on the, how much it costs to build out lab space for the tenant. Sure, absolutely. Um, so as far as the tenant fit out, I'll start there. Um, a lot of what we're finding is that it's, it's really base building work required. And so, um, you know, it, it's around, um, you know, we're spending $44 million for a 350,000 square foot building, which is about 134, 130 bucks a foot for the base building conversion. Rent and, rentable. Is uh, that rentable? Yes, that's rentable. Gross, yeah, rentable. rentable. Okay, um, And so, so you start there, and, and that's really table stakes to even get out in the market and, and be able to offer a building with those types of specs. Um, for, um, for the TI package, we've just keyed off of the Cambridge market, and we talked to Steve's team and Jonathan. It's on the order of it can go up to about 150 bucks a foot, but a lot of tenants don't demand that. So it, there's a large range, actually, and, and I think we, we certainly wouldn't want to start by offering that. But it's, it's um, I would say, office TI package plus um, to get started. But the interesting thing is once you have that type of a fit out, um, you know, we've, we've definitely been weighing the risks of, um, you know, the, the creditworthiness of life science tenants, tenants and especially growth companies, what happens if one, you know, blows out and you have to replace them. Often with an office fit out, and Steve, you could, you know, back me up here if you agree with this, um, 
you need to, it's basically a long consultative process to get to what fit out is perfect for an office use and it's very you know, design driven and it's, it's gotta match the exact branding of those types of companies. Um, for lab use, it, it's really more about the specs required for them to conduct their job and so if it's built to a class A standard, that's not gonna go away a decade from now and so the conversion TI is way less than you would need to spend day one. And so that's part of the math that makes it attractive on, on a releasing scenario. Um, rents, I would I'd rather not uh, comment on the dollars, but I'd say it's, it's a you know, 20 to 25 percent premium on face rates of what, um, of what we think that office tenants are willing to pay, and that's really just driven by the profitability of these companies. So the ones that it's a, it's a good match where they are hungry for several floors of space, they're probably um, you know, infused with enough capital to make it not as much about the cost of rent, and it's more about are they occupying you know, a good dot on the map that's perfect for their employees and part of a good building that allows them to do their work. And so it's, we think there's um, more willingness to pay for the right companies that you're able to find. Thanks. Uh, so, um, so my calculus says that's about 110 a foot. Uh, we would but, take uh, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> Steve and Bill, Steve Papur and Bill, could you comment on rents and what, ten what rents tenants are prepared to pay? We have, we have developers here, and we're looking to fill out our performers. Uh, sure, yeah. So um, it's funny because uh, when you uh, get to the point in the presentation where people want to look at comps, um, there's just not a lot to look at, uh, and so it's a little theoretical. Uh, I will tell you that in, you know, in Cambridge, uh, the, the upper end of the rents that we're seeing now are uh, year one rents in the, you know, the mid-90s net um, you know, with annual bumps that are 2.5% you know, to 3% on a 15-year deal. So the, you get out in a term, um, you know, the rents are you know, pretty significant, especially in the backdrop of what a Boston office rent would be. Um, New York's a little uncharted uh, as we get through it, and we're trying to figure it all out. I, you know, I, I think that it's safe to say that a, you know, that a large, larger user probably will have a higher percentage of office, so spend a little bit less on their space. But they could spend, you know, upward of, uh, you know, two, 250 to 300 bucks a foot, you know, um, including the allowance. I think it's safe to underwrite rents, um, you know, pretty solidly, um, you know, in the in the uh, upper 70s net, and you know, well-located product in, in Manhattan. Um, you know, I would just add the one other comment on sort of where it's going to happen. I actually think it's going to happen in, in all the different areas uh, for a variety of different reasons. I think there's a, you know, there's a place. You know, for another building with Alexandria, for sure. There's, you know, and that rent, you know, will be significantly different than maybe something in Long Island City. But I think there's a place in Long Island City, and then up in Harlem, the same thing. Uh, you know, I think it's safe to say that it's a significant premium off of what you would get from an office rent uh, in the marketplace. So I, I'd, I'd, I'd agree with that, um, uh, both on the numbers and also the locations. I think um, again, if you look at the uh, the Boston example, there's there's Longwood, there's the uh, the Seaport, um, both in addition to uh, Kendall Square. Um, in terms of rent, I think it's it's actually um, somewhat surprising for a lot of New Yorkers. We're uh, used to uh, quoting on a on a gross basis. Um, I've I think that the rents in Manhattan are seventy. I mean, look at from a landlord uh, perspective, it's 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 as much as you can get. I think from from a tenant's uh, perspective, there is a there is a threshold of pain. I think that. Um, you know the rents uh, that we're hearing are 75, 80, 85 dollars uh, a square foot, triple net. Um, I think I think one of the advantages of going a little bit further afield, um, Manhattanville, Long Island City, is that you can be um, a little bit more competitive on on price. But I think that that one of the great perceptions um, of obstacle to to uh, life science real estate um, in New York City has uh, hi um, historically been cost. And I think that the Boston example um, really disproves that. OK, thank you. We do have time for a couple of questions from the audience. we got a very good panel. I'm sure that there are things that you want to hear about. Do we have anyone? Yes. Your plans? Do regional and metropolitan rail challenges factor into your plans to build a powerhouse life sciences uh, industry in New York? I would just say, you know, and, I, and I'm always comparing everything to Boston. Uh, compared to Boston, you know, as Bill said, the, the, uh, the transportation, you know, for those of you that live in New York are frustrated. It's amazing. You know, um, 
you know, I, I was saying to somebody earlier, like, I, you never ride public transportation in Boston, and our traffic is just as bad as yours. And getting into Cambridge, and specifically East Cambridge, uh, is one of the most difficult places to get into. Um, so um, I think the, uh, the labor side of it and the accessibility of it um, will trump that. I mean, clearly, um, I always, you know, say when I first got here, the idea of, uh, you know, life science and, you know, everyone was pushing towards the outer ends of Brooklyn and sort of secondary locations that didn't have good public transportation and, and it was a non-starter because, you know, I think the life science companies are, are people too uh, and they live in, in and they need to commute into the city as well. So I think obviously improved infrastructure uh, would benefit, you know, the life science idea um, like any other sector. Um, I would just add that uh, uh, Steve talked about uh, Penn Station, um, obviously Long Island Railroad, uh, New Jersey Transit, Amtrak. I'd, I'll, I'll plug Grand Central uh, for those uh, coming down from uh, Connecticut and Westchester. Grand Central, um, a great transportation node. And again, I don't, I don't want to be uh, seen as uh, shilling for Long Island City, but it's, it's, it's three stops away from uh, Grand Central. So the, the, uh, the tenant that I had uh, alluded to was actually coming from the uh, Connecticut area. And um, Long Island City was uh, a site that they really liked because of the, uh, the other proximity for uh, public transportation. If you also think about some of the, the expats that, uh, that New York has seen, um, it's actually not only New Jersey, but if you think about the Regenerons, you think about the Accordas, they're actually north of the city as opposed to west. One, one more question. Let me add one thing on oh, that sorry. point. Sorry, the, the, I think the, the other part that plays into our calculus is just um, you, why New York should show up on the, on the radar as far as a growing life sciences market, I think in large part is due to the established presence of the universities and the healthcare systems. And so not just thinking about transit vis-a-vis -a, -vis a tenant and can you appeal to a certain company, but how are you relative to the other um, spots where you know those institutions could send people your way. So that's worked out very well for the Genome Center. And I think um, just have, having that awareness of how do you fit in the whole scheme, and because it is about the people and, and about not just one company, but the interconnectivity of people making their way to your space. Yes. And the Hi. Um, I mean, I know you're talking to a lot of real estate people. But a little bit of this sounds like, if you build it, will they come? And, and thinking about how we've done it, frankly, in the past, uh, you know, there were a couple of things that really made New York a tech hub. Um, one was the fact that the people were here, and we just kind of brought an association together, and, you know, the bigger companies came because the smaller companies were here and the, and the um, you know, innovation was here. Um, you know, what brought Novartis to, uh, to Cambridge? Was it the fact that uh, there was cheap rent or there was real estate or was it because there was institutions and there was an association and, uh, you know, it's, I mean, not build it and they will come, but here it is and build it for them, I think, is a much... Uh, Greater. Doug, you want to, do you want yeah. to start us on that? I'll at least start. So um, I, I think we that's something we hear at EDC a lot. Um, I, I think one example that you can point to where it's worked is the Alexandria Center. You have 720,000 square feet where uh, over the last seven to 10 years, that model has worked. Bill alluded to that being one of the centers uh, of gravity of, of life science in, in New York City. So I think You've got a mix there of academic institutions. Eli Lilly just expanded their R&D presence last November there. I think that says something, uh, certainly in the market. And you've got growing companies, some of the uh, VC-backed companies that uh, Mitch referred to it in his opening remarks are based there as well. So um, it's not to say that that's, um, you know, if you build it, that will, that will happen by any means. But I think one of the things we're seeing is other entrants, besides great organic growth, which is, is starting to come uh, with a higher volume and higher quality, where you've got significant venture capital raises, you're also seeing uh, large pharma and biotech companies pay more attention from a real estate perspective. Uh, Biolabs at NYU has done a great job landing uh, large bio biotech and pharma corporate sponsors, uh, both Bristol Myers and Beringer Ingelheim. 
um, have uh, a partnership uh, with them. They're starting to pay attention to those early stage companies uh, much more and, and have eyes on that without a physical real estate presence. Uh, J Labs entering the market, I think that's uh, certainly significant uh, and starting to see just other uh, pharmaceutical companies, biotech companies uh, pay attention. I think the fact that Pfizer is um, going to move from the east side to the west side, I think that, you know, that certainly is a good thing, that, that area in Hudson Yards, uh, there are additional pharma companies. So to the point that was brought up earlier, there are going to be a number of different clusters. And I think it's something that when you have Steve come up and talk about Boston with companies like Biogen and Genzyme, uh, it's very easy for this audience to think that that can happen overnight, and it didn't in Boston. So we do want to encourage the, the organic growth and have a company like Regeneron have the opportunity to stay here. And some of that lab space and the, the buildings that we're talking about will, will give them those opportunities, but it may take um, some other entrants to come in and, and be a part of that physical space as well. John, can I just add to that? Sure. Um, I think that um, I think historically, if you look at, at at Boston and and Cambridge and the demand that is created out of the co-working spaces, I think it's it's somewhere between a two and three x uh, on on an annual square footage basis. So we now have about a hundred thousand square feet of of co-working spaces. Even if you shrink the uh, the multiple down to to one and a half or two x, it implies a certain level of demand. And that's just from the co-working spaces. If we then start talking about um, companies that are uh, outgrowing Alexandria, if we start talking about uh, companies spinning out of the institutions uh, themselves, and maybe even uh, stealing someone from, uh, from Boston or New Jersey, I think that there is a very um, healthy level of latent demand. So I, I like about, that. You're talking about co-working spaces, which was the small guys. Right, and the question, and, and what we had found is that, you know, the small guys are the ones that attract the big guys, not the big guys bring in Novartis or something, and that'll attract small guys. Even even uh, Hudson Square was built on uh, the co-working spaces and uh, you know creating those small guys. I would just say the medium guys are what I think you're missing. The medium guys are, are more important, and I'll give you an example. Uh, Semaphore is a company that uh, incubated at Mount Sinai that's uh, in Fairfield County now. Um, you know, when you look at uh, the lack of space, the office space uh, idea for, for tech is totally different, right? I mean, so a tech group can come in and take office space in this building uh, or in any building. And so their, their ability to grow and scale is totally different. In a life science company, when you, when you graduate and you get that 50 or $80 million round, you don't want to wait 18 months to move into your space. You're not willing to wait 18 months. And so you find a location that you can move in quicker. I think that if this market uh, had developed uh, a better infrastructure around the graduation space two or three years ago, I think that the market would be four or five million square feet. And so I think it's critically important that you address the, 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 uh, the real estate side of this equation or you're going to continue to lose the semaphores, who was a 100,000 square foot company, um, you know, to Fairfield and to New Jersey and to, and to these different locations. I, I, I think biotechs not only want to be near academic medical centers but need to be. I think the younger generation want it. They don't even want to own cars. They want to be in the city. So I totally agree. If we can col collectively solve the real estate issue, there's a tremendous market. These companies and the scientists want to be in a city like New York. Yeah, I, I would just add, um, whether it's the semaphore example or others, um, we want to change that equation for certainly those companies to have those opportunities. Uh, to stay here and grow here to be that mid-size uh, and eventually larger company. What we're also seeing in instances like a semaphore is they still have engineering talent here. Uh, and that's a very attractive part of New York City based on the last 10 years. Uh, you'll hear later in the panels uh, today about bioinformatics and some of the other emerging technologies that intersect with this. And I think that's something that we're seeing a lot of these companies grow that might be more uh, data sent data scientist or tech driven uh, that intersect with a traditional life science or biotech company. And so that may be something you want to be considering uh, for some of those uh, space-based initiatives uh, to attract some of those companies that, that are popping up uh, throughout New York City. Yes, growth is uh, very important. And as you all can hear, this is, there's a lot of complex issues here. Unfortunately, we're out of time. So thank you very much to the panelists. You did a great job.